Hey, thanks for joining us for this Christmas series. My name is Josh and I'm so glad that you've connected with us. We'd love to connect further and I'd ask you to go to branchlife.church to fill out your connection card before you log off. I hope that this conversation today will encourage you during this season of your life. Thanks again for joining us. I'll see you after the talk. Isn't there anyone who can tell me what Christmas is all about? Sure, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with a great multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to the God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom is pleased. That's what Christmas is all about. Well, as Chris said, my name is Josh, and I just want to welcome you, if this is your first time with us, or if you're joining us online, to this series that we're calling The Meaning of Christmas. It's all from that little moment in the Charlie Brown special where Charlie Brown, in frustration, in the midst of the craziness of Christmas, and said, can anyone tell me what Christmas is all about? He kind of shouts it. His buddy Linus comes up and says, sure, Charlie, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. And he then steps on the platform, and he reads Luke 2 where the angels appear to the shepherds and they announce to everyone that Jesus Christ has been born as a baby. And it's good news of great joy, which will be to all people. And they are told to look to find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. And then the multitude of angels came and they sang, glory to God in the highest peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Could we all use a little bit more peace and goodwill toward each other? That's what the gift that Jesus gives to us is. And so we have been looking at these different parts of the story to see the meaning of Christmas that's actually all around us. And when you look for it, you can be reminded in powerful ways this Christmas season what God is doing and what the true meaning of Christmas is. When you see the star, when you see an angel up in lights, today we're going to talk about the baby. And then over the next week, we're going to finish out the series, but we're going to do it in two unique ways. On our Christmas Eve service, we're going to be talking about all of this one more time with the theme of miracles at its core. And so as you come and as you serve and as you bring your friends, I guarantee this, we're going to point to Jesus with every fiber of our being. We're going to clearly present the gospel and the opportunity for some to come to Christ. And we're asking and trusting that God will do great things through this Christmas Eve time and through this week. And then next Christmas, Christmas Day, my plan is to be utterly and totally exhausted in that moment. And we're going to gather together as families all around our community. We're going to open gifts around the Christmas trees. We're going to gather for breakfast and brunches and lunches and meals. It sounds like Whoville. <laughs> and here's, here's the opportunity that I think we have that we may have never had before in all of history. We have the opportunity now, because we've figured out how to do this over the last three years, to worship together at home. We're putting on four services. We're asking God to see people saved during Christmas Eve. And I I pray that you guys every day would pray for the Christmas Eve services, even if you're out of town, even if you can't be with us. And a shout out to those of you that are watching online who are a part of Branch because you're out of town today. Would you, would you pray for the Christmas Eve services that God would do something powerful? We're going all in with 40 volunteers for each services. We're, we're giving to the community. We just finished giving away, ended up being almost 300 food boxes, hundreds of toys uh, over this past weekend. We've been called on to serve families in need during this time, and we're just sprinting to this Christmas Eve service, hoping that God's going to do some great things. And, and here's, the, here's the chance that we have on Sunday mor- on Christmas Day. Would you as a family... Amidst all of this, you're opening the presents, the wrappings are everywhere, you've got the food laid out. Would you pause, but do it together as a family to worship at home? We're going to lead you as a church 
We're going to premiere our at-home worship at our same times, 9 and 1030, but it's going to be available all day. And we want you to tune in to, to get on your phones and your televisions and to queue up the, the worship service and then join us in worshiping together at home. And, and maybe for some of you, this will be the first time you've experienced at-home worship with your family. And you're, you're going to not only be asked to participate in hearing about the ending of our series, but you're going to be asked to pray together as a family. You're going to be asked to just respond together as a family. And, and I want to encourage you before, during, or after, if you would do more than what we do online. Maybe you read the Bible together. Maybe you, you each pray together out loud or, or whatever. Maybe you sing together as a family. And just do that at some point on Christmas Day. Some of you will have an additional opportunity of including a friend or a family member or a neighbor who doesn't typically worship. Invite them to worship with you. Say, hey, we're stopping as a household to worship God on this Christmas Day because isn't this a great day to worship God? And we want to invite you to do that with us. And, and on that Christmas morning, they'll hear the meaning of Christmas. So I'm very excited about it. I'm praying that this would be special for all of us wherever we find ourselves on Christmas Day. And then we'll be back here on New Year's Day, like normal, 9 o'clock. I'm not expecting anyone to be at that service. And then 1030. And we're going to worship together. As a family, and I just want to mention this before we move on, it's been a difficult week for the Branch family and for our community here. Oh, man. Um. Becky Albright and Amy Pollinger, both a part of our family. Becky is our church administrator. Their dad passed away suddenly of a heart attack this week. 63 years old, in seemingly good health, at work in Philadelphia. One moment here, one moment with the Lord. Becky's dad is also our next door neighbor. Literally live across the field from us. And so they have been wonderful neighbors to Branch. And so on Monday, we're gathering here. And we're remembering and celebrating Kevin's life. We're going to be doing a celebration of life service at 11 o'clock. I don't think we have enough seats. So for our branch family, I want to invite you to come to support the Pollingers, Becky, his, her, their mom, the rest of their, their clan. But be ready, branch family, if there's not enough seats to go to some overflow areas that we'll have set up. There's a family visitation from 9.30 to 10, the service is at 11, and then a luncheon after, and I know many of you have already reached out, many of you are already serving. But with all of those things happening, and then this moment in, within our family, and I know a lot of you are dealing with some difficult stuff, I thought it'd be appropriate just to pause and pray before we preach this morning. Would you join me in prayer? God and Heavenly Father, what an incredible privilege it is today to be a part of the family of God. During this Christmas season, Lord, we've done our best to point to you and to point others to you, to serve our community with love and compassion, to be mirrors of the love of Jesus. And God, would you continue to help us do that well? Help us to do that well in our homes. Help us to do that well in our neighborhoods. Help us to do that well through the rest of this season, whether we're doing last-minute shopping or we're comforting a friend or family member in need. And Lord, we pray for Becky, for Amy, for their extended family, for the friends and the neighbors here that are suffering sudden loss. We pray, Lord, that you would give them great peace that passes understanding. Lord, that you would show them the incredible love that you have for them through us. And Lord, that you would allow the celebration of life service on uh, tomorrow to be a moment that helps them in their grieving, reminds them of the gift of Kevin that he was to each one, Lord, and points to Jesus. We know that tomorrow there are many friends and family members who will come who don't know Jesus that will hear Kevin's testimony, and we pray that you would use it in their lives to draw them close to you. We pray, Lord, the same as we move into the Christmas Eve celebrations, and God, we remember who you are and what you've done for each one of us, that no matter what our story is, 
you're inviting us to have a relationship with you. And that when we've accepted you as our personal Savior, when we've confessed our sins, God, as Kevin had, has done, Lord, as, as we've trusted in you, that in this life and the life to come, we have eternal life with Jesus. We have hope in heaven. We have joy unspeakable and peace unexplainable because of Christ. So God, help us in these moments and then in our at-home worship over this Christmas season to just be able to glorify you and to rest in who you are. God, we, we pray that you would guide our steps this week as we continue to demonstrate our love for God and neighbor. In your precious name we pray, amen. So the last symbol that we're talking about this week, not the last symbol, but the one that we're going to talk about this morning, is the symbol of the baby. Now, if you look, during Christmas, there are babies literally everywhere. They're on cardboard cut cutouts outside. They're on spotlights and paintings. They're on sides of buildings. They're hanging in decorations and on Christmas tree ornaments. They're probably on your mantle or your table right now. How many have a baby on your mantle or your table right now? They come in all shapes and sizes. There's giant porcelain ones like we have here, a little wooden ones, and the ones made out of craft paper that our kids put together. We have the willow tree uh, ornament set. That's been years in collecting, right? Like, because that's awesome and amazing. And, and there's, there's names and brands, and there's ones that have been in your family forever. And you get to put these out every Christmas season, and one of the most powerful reminders of the meaning of Christmas is in that moment when you take the meaning of Christmas, baby Jesus, and you put him on display, Yes, we have the trees. Yes, we have the gifts and the, and the lights, and we do all of that work. But maybe the most important symbol, the most important reminder is the baby Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, as the angels are appearing to the shepherds, it says to you, For unto you is born this day in the city of David, who is, Christ, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign unto you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Christmas is ultimately a birthday. It's the birthday of Jesus, the one who changed the world. I had a fascinating conversation. And this, this doesn't happen rarely, but it rarely happens on the same day. I had a conversation with a gentleman who uh, does, is not a follower of Jesus, and then about two hours later, another conversation with another gentleman who wasn't a follower of Jesus, and we had literally the same conversation. Both men grew up in the Catholic tradition. Both men had said to me, just voluntarily, I didn't push back or anything, I, I grew up Catholic, but I don't believe that stuff. I don't know what stuff they're talking about. And I always say, and I got lots of friends who are Catholic and everything like that, you know, and I always say to my friends, I, I can help you with that whole Catholic thing, and they laugh at me. So I said the same thing, and they're talking about this, the problems that they have with faith, and the problems that they have with religion, and the problems that they have with tradition, and the problems that they have with men who make mistakes, and, and both of them have disconnected from the church, but yet they do stuff on Christmas, and they get back together, and they put baby Jesus up, and, and they have all these conversations, and I said to the one guy, I said, hey, you know, it's, it's not about like the confession and stuff, it's actually not about like adding anything to the Bible, it's all about what you do with Jesus, Right? What do you do with baby Jesus is the most important thing ever. It's the foundational question. You don't have to know the answers about the beginning of man. You don't have to know like all the details that are found in the Bible. You don't have to understand every religion of the world. You just simply have to be able to answer this question, who is Jesus, right? And he began having a conversation with me, and he goes, you know what? I think everybody thinks Jesus actually existed. I'm like, yeah, I think everyone's good with that. And then Jesus was a good guy, and he did good things, and I think we can learn things from Jesus. And I said, yeah, I agree with that. But if he's not God, then I don't really care about anything he has to say. He said, what, what, why? And I said, if he's not God and he claims to be God, well, then he's a liar. But I, then I said this, if Jesus is God in flesh, then everything he says has to be true. 
And then, then I've got to lean into the Bible. Then I've got to lean into the words of Christ. And I've got to lean into the message of Jesus and not just take it as one really good thing out there. I've got to take it as the thing. Well, then he goes, how do you know Jesus is God? Is that glad you asked? Because he's the only guy that rose from the dead. And then he said this. Yeah, well, I think he wasn't really dead. Happens all the time. You think someone's dead, you bury him, and you find out he's still alive. And I'm like, I don't know what articles you're reading, but I don't think that happens all the time. Like, I don't think that's really a thing as much as you think it's a thing. And he's like, no, it's really a thing. I just read it on the internet. I'm like, the internet? Yeah, the internet. And so he said, now what if Jesus didn't actually die, and what if he was just really, really close to dead, and they buried him in the tomb, and then that's why he got up and left. And I said, you're just trying to explain the events of the day. And listen, you, you're, you have to believe that the Romans didn't know what they were doing with the crucifixion, that he somehow survived uh, being beaten, his lungs being exposed, being tortured, being hung on a cross, suffocating, legs broken, spear in the side, dead in front of every. Somehow he had to survive all of that and then be able to get up three days later and be fine? It takes more faith for me to believe that Jesus had fainted than it does for me to believe that he was miraculously risen from the dead. But if Jesus actually did raise from the dead, well, now we've got something. And this moment where Jesus rose from the dead is a moment that literally changed the world. There was a movement. There were people that gave their life for Jesus because it was so spectacular and so undeniable in that day that this Jesus died and rose again from the dead. And the reason it was such a slam dunk case is because he was born a baby if if jesus just showed up on the scene and nobody knew where he came from if they didn't know his history if they didn't know his parents if they didn't know where he was born if they didn't know what country he was from if he just showed up and he said i'm gonna die for you and he died and he rose again from the dead everyone it wouldn't it wouldn't be a sure thing but there's a reason that Jesus didn't show up as an adult or a king or a conqueror or a warrior. There's a reason that Jesus was born to Mary. There's a reason that he was in Nazareth and Bethlehem and in a manger. There's a reason that a star showed up. There's a reason that he had to be born as an innocent child. And we're answering that question today, why a baby? Why a baby? And, and in Philippians chapter 2 it says that we're supposed to have the mind of Jesus who humbled himself, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, yet he emptied himself and became a man, right? That incarnational moment where God through Jesus becomes man in the form of a baby he's born and is obedient even unto death. That's the moment we're talking about today. Now, First Peter, a guy who walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus and understood where he came from, in First Peter, Peter tells us why he had to be born a baby. It may be one of the clunkiest Christmas passages. You might be like, I didn't think this was a Christmas passage, but it totally is. And when you stop and start reading through First Peter and start understanding what they're talking about, the baby Jesus, you understand that, man, this sheds a lot of light on why Jesus had to be born a baby. Now, you know you're in trouble because today I brought the big Bible, and I couldn't find the little Bible this morning, so the big Bible was the closest one. So I'm getting a workout, and I'm going to speak extra long because all these notes are in here. So the big Bible's out. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20. I'm going to cheat into verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, he was like a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last time for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by the obedience of truth, with the sincerity of brotherly love, that's Philadelphia, baby, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living, abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, 
and all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass wither and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And the word is the good news. That's the gospel that was preached to you. In, in 1 Peter, we learn what Jesus is for. And today you're going to see that Jesus was born as a baby for four reasons. That he's foreknown, that he's for you, that he's for God, and he's forever. And we as a church have a mission. We have an assignment to let the world know why baby Jesus was born and what he was born for. So many of us in our Christian walk can fall into the trap that we fail at letting people know what we're for because we're so good at letting them know what we're against. And people know what we don't like. People know who, who we judge. People know what we hate and what we think they shouldn't do, but they don't know what we're for. And I would love, as, as the story of Branch Life Church unfolds, as God continues to allow us to grow, that we would be a light for Jesus because Jesus is for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus is for you. Now, let's break down these fours. And as we go through it, let's be known for what we're for and be less known for what we're against. The first thing that we see in 1 Peter that Jesus was born for is he was foreknown. Forgive my wordplay. He was foreknown. In, in 1 Peter 1.12, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but it was made manifest in the last times. The reason Jesus was born as a baby is because it was predicted that way. It was said that this is what was going to happen. There was a plan from before time that Jesus would be born a baby. So when Jesus was born a baby, it had to be that way. It was prophecy fulfilled. It was God keeping his word. And we see this over and over and over again in Scripture. In 700 years before Jesus Christ was born, it says this, For unto us a child is born. 700 years it was predicted that Jesus would be born, the Messiah would be born as a child. Unto us a son is given, it's going to be a baby boy, and the government will be on his shoulders, and the name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. God will come on earth. He will show up as a baby, and this was said 700 years through the prophet Isaiah before Jesus ever came. Earlier in that same book, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign and the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. Isaiah wasn't the only prophet in the Old Testament to foretell the coming of Christ as a baby. 500 years before Christ, it says, the Lord says to Bethlehem, you might not be an important town in the nations of Judah, but out of you will come the ruler over Israel for me. His family line will go back to the early years of your nation, and it goes all the way back to your days long ago. You know who Jesus' great, 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 great grandfather is? Abraham. All the way back to the beginning and the founding of Israel. And there's a line that travels through men and women through the ages, and we have that lineage all through the Old Testament. Why do we have those things? Because it became extremely important. That Jesus didn't just show up random, but that he would be shown as the one, the only one, who would fulfill not just these prophecies, but over 300 prophecies. Can't be made up, can't be coincidence, can't be happenstance, can't be just some guy fainted on the cross and got up out of the grave one day. It has to be Jesus, it has to be God, because he's the fulfiller of prophecy, so why do I believe that Jesus is God? Well, he rose again from the dead. And all that happened was told to us before it happened. And Jesus perfectly fulfills every single one of those prophecies. Over 1,400 years before Christ, it said, A star shall come forth from Jacob, 
and a scepter shall rise from Israel. This is why the Magi were staring into the sky, waiting for a king to be born in Bethlehem. That's why they traveled. That's why they gave gold and frankincense and myrrh, because of these prophecies. Now, that gives you confidence in your faith. But I want you to be reminded of a powerful truth that can give you comfort today. There is, God never makes a promise that he won't keep. My God never makes a promise that he won't keep. Amen? When God promised that he would send a Messiah, he kept that promise. When God promised that it would be a baby boy born in Bethlehem, he kept that promise. When he said a star would mark the coming of the king, he kept that promise. God is the keeper of every promise. Now, have you thought recently about the incredible promises that are found in the word of God? Every time you read scripture, every time you read scripture, you will come across something that God says will happen, something that he says he will do, a promise that he makes. Let me just kind of mention some of them. Again, in Isaiah 40, he promises to give strength to the weary. Anybody tired? Anybody need a little strength today? My God doesn't make promises he won't keep. He promises that he will give you rest if you come to him. He promises that his love will never fail. Do you feel broken? Do you feel dirty? Do you feel shame? Do you feel unwanted or unloved? The promise of God is that his love never fails. He loved you so much that he died for you. And he will walk with you even when you feel unloved. Or unlovable. In Colossians, he promises for those that believe in Christ, you will be redeemed, that you will be adopted. He promises in Exodus that he will fight for you. In James, he promises to give wisdom to everybody who asks. He promises to be your protection from evil. In 1 John, if you if you confess, he promises to forgive. No questions asked. In Romans, he promises to make you new. In Luke, he says he promises he'll forgive you if you forgive others. In Matthew, he promises to exalt the humble. In John 3, 16, he promises to give all those who believe eternal life. He promises to set you free. He promises that if you ask in prayer, you will receive. Philippians chapter 4, 19, he promises to meet all your needs. Call on him and he promises to answer. You seek first the kingdom of God, he promises that you will find it. He promises that if you trust in him, he will make your path straight. He's promised that he's preparing a place for you right now. And he's promised that he's coming again soon. My God is a God who keeps promises. You can trust in the word of of the Lord. And when you see baby Jesus this Christmas, sweet baby Jesus, hang on to just one of those promises. When it gets hard, when it gets dark, hang on to one of those promises because you know that God always keeps his promises. The second thing that God reminds us through Jesus is that Jesus came because he is for you. He came for you. When Jesus was born, he was born for you. When Jesus died on the cross, he was thinking of you. When Jesus lived his life and taught, he was teaching you. You are cherished above all others in God's eyes and in God's heart. In in 1 Peter 1, 20 and 21, for the sake of you who through him are believers in God. Why was God foreknown? Why was Jesus born? He was born for the sake of you. First, remember this, that Jesus loves you. God, through Jesus, loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave. What did he give? How many of you guys have bought a Christmas gift already? Right? Oh, boy. You got some shopping to do. Or I sprung a question on you and you weren't ready to answer yet. Right? Okay, here we go. Let's pause for a second. Take a deep breath. Take your pens off your notes. How many of you have bought a Christmas gift already? Amen. There we go. I was up late, I'm, I'm, I was up, I won't, I won't tell you my tales this week, but I was up late and I, I was, my brain was going and so I was shopping on Amazon like crazy. Like I just, I was like, yeah, put that in my cart, yeah, put that in my cart. Like she's going to love this, put that in my cart, right? 
And I put it in my cart, and I got to my cart, and I went to check out, and I went, how much is all that going to be on my cart? You know, so I'm buying this stuff, right? It was expensive. Like, it's like, wow, I must really love my family. <laughs> like, I'm totally giving them a lot of expensive stuff. Like, I'm awesome. <laughs> when you give a gift, you're expressing your love, right? Now, it's the thought that counts, so if you get a cheap gift, don't get upset this year. And if you do something stupid, like get your uh, wife a, a, a scale, don't do that. But it's the thought that counts. That was last Christmas, if you remember that one. Still living that one down. That's why my outbox is like, that's expensive this year, because you got to make it up, right? I told her, I said, one of them's on the borderline. I'm really risking it again, but I think you'll like it. But I don't know. I'll tell you how it goes next week. All right? So... So we got, we're getting it. And so you buy them this and you get them this stuff because you love them, right? Well, when Jesus thinks of you, right, for God so loved the world that he gave, all right, God, what are you going to give me? He gave you his one and only son. He gave you his only child. There's no price tag at the bottom of your Amazon cart that can express the value of that gift that God gave you. God loved you so much that he said, the most precious thing that I have in all the world is my son, and I'm giving you my one and only son, and I'm giving him to you so you can mock him, so you can torture him, so you can imprison him, and so you can crucify him, and I'm giving him to you because he's going to survive those things, miraculously rise from the dead, proving that he is the Messiah of the world, God in flesh, so that you can now have eternal life with me. And by the way, if my son's not enough, I'm preparing a mansion for you in glory. God loves you. He desperately cares for you. And he wants you to be a part of the family of God. And he wants you to bring in the adoption of God that he has for you in these precious moments. God loves you you. To show that, Jesus had to be born a baby. He had to give you his son as a child. The second reason we know he's for us is because because Jesus was born, God through Jesus, he understands every pain. He understands every pain. If Jesus came as an adult, if Jesus came as a king, if Jesus came as an angel, if he came as a spirit, he wouldn't understand you and I. But we have in Hebrews 14 a high priest, not a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in in every respect has been tempted as we are. He knows that draw of your heart to go where you shouldn't go, to do what you shouldn't do, to lose your temper, to be selfish. He understands all of those things. He knows what it means to be tired and hungry. He knows what it means to be jealous and and full of rage. He understands these natural inclinations that we have because we were born as kids. He was tempted in every way you are, yet without sin. So let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive every mercy and find grace in our time of need. God gets you. God gets your pain. God understands your grief. At some point in the story of Jesus, we believe that Joseph died. Because Joseph doesn't show up in any of the crucifixion accounts. Mary is there by herself over and over again. Joseph is around when Jesus was a little boy. We see that in the beginning of Luke. But then all of a sudden, when Jesus is a 30-year-old man, Joseph's not around. And this wouldn't be abnormal back in these days. They didn't have the lifespan that we have living into our 70s, 80s, 90s, and even 100. A lot of times, they died young as young parents. And these kids would grow up without a mom or a dad. And that seems to be the case in Jesus. If that's true, if if that's absolutely what happened, Jesus absolutely understands what it's like to lose a father. He knows that pain and that grief. He's traveled through that. And so back 10 10 plus years ago, when Jenny and I got home two days after Christmas from Michigan and we get the phone call that her dad's had a sudden heart attack and we get rush on a plane and get back there and he lost his life two days after Christmas, I didn't have a God who didn't understand our pain. I didn't have a God who didn't understand our questions. I didn't have a God who was removed from that. I have a God who absolutely understands what's happening in this moment. But when you travel through something difficult, 
This is one of the greatest truths that we can forget because we say something like this. Where was God when I really needed him? Where was God when the heart attack happened? Where was God when the divorce went through? Where was God when my child rebelled? And all of a sudden we start saying, oh, I, I don't think God really does understand. I don't think God is around. I want you to remember this powerful truth. God never saw a need he couldn't meet. God never saw a need he couldn't meet. And, and here's what you need to remind yourself in these moments where you feel like God is not meeting your needs. Because the truth is, he is. There's three steps I want you to take. Step number one, when you don't feel like God's around, run. Run into the strong tower. In Psalms, it says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it, and they are saved. You have a choice when you're going through a difficult moment. You can run away from God, or you can run towards God. That's your only two options. And what I'm saying to you is run towards God when you don't understand. Run towards God when you don't think he's listening. Run towards God. You know, notice that it didn't say God's supposed to run towards us, right? It says we're supposed to run towards him. We got to take that sprint. We got to run into his arms. He is there ready to meet every single one of our needs. And his name is a strong tower and the righteous run into it. Then when you run to God, you don't have to have your questions answered. You don't have to know what's going on. You don't have to know why in this moment. Then what you do, step two, is you simply wait. Just wait. Those who wait upon the Lord, those who wait upon the Lord, will have their strength renewed. They will mount up on wings as eagles. Wait. The Bible never says how long we have to wait. It may be longer than you want to. It may not just be hours, it may be days, it may be weeks, it may be years before you ever grasp the needs that God is meeting in those moments. But just wait on him and trust in him Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Just wait. Just wait on him. And then number three, watch. Watch. In the darkest and in the hardest moments that were preordained before time, God knew about the heart attack. God knew about the loss. God knew about the depression. God knew about the disease. In those hardest moments, God's the sovereign. He's got a plan. So I, I don't know, so I'm running to you. I, I don't have answers, so I'm waiting on you. And now I'm going to watch, and you will, when you watch, you're going to see God doing amazing things. He's going to send a hug at the right time. He's going to provide for that bill. He's, he's going to give you a moment of peace that passes understanding. He's going to cause a memory to show up in that right moment. He, he will begin meeting needs. And, and in, the, in the fog of war, we don't see all that God is doing in the moments that we're hurting the most. But you need to know this. If you watch, if you look for God and look for who he sends and the signs that he shows you, you will see him over and over and over again. And guess what he's going to be doing all along the way? He's going to be meeting your needs. He's going to be walking with you. Why? Because he loves you. Because he understands you. Because he's been there. And he's God. The third reason we know, we know Jesus had to be born a baby is for God. For God. You see, in, in 1 Peter 1, 20, 21, then it goes on to say, God raised him, Jesus, from the dead and gave him, Jesus, glory so that your faith and hope are in God. How does an unexplainable, uncomprehendable God reveal himself to us? He does it through Jesus. We know God because we see Jesus. We know God's love. We know God's power. We know God's compassion. We know God's uh, 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 teaching because of Jesus. Jesus reveals God to us so that we can have faith and hope in that God. That's why he had to be born, so that God could reveal himself to us. And so in these passages, we see, uh, oh, I'll go back one. Because of Jesus, we can see God, for God said, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, and God has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's, that's something, right? 
We get the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. How do we see God? Look to Jesus. How do we see God? Look to Jesus. And you think about the shepherds seeing the baby, the face of, of Jesus Christ. You think about the wise men of Mary and Joseph, right? They saw the face of this baby child, and they understood in that moment the glory of God. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Goodwill towards men. All come through the person of Jesus. Listen, God always gives light where there is dark. God always gives light where there is dark. The very first page of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, he breaks out the big Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, as we think about the beginning of time, what God did in those moments, you see this promise being fulfilled. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, what's the next phrase? Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness, and the light he called day, and the darkness he called night, and evening and morning were the first day. Do you know that God created light before he created the sun, moon, and stars? God created light before he created the sun, moon, and stars. You see, God is in the business of bringing light into darkness. And your heart once was dark with sin, believer. And the light of Jesus shines in the, into our hearts. When we ask for forgiveness, he forgives us our sin and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. In our dark height, our, our dark hearts, Jesus wants to shine his light. And if you're on a faith journey and you have not yet accepted Jesus as your personal savior this Christmas, I want you to look into the face of Jesus and understand this. You cannot understand salvation without Christ. You cannot understand what it means to follow Jesus without Christ. Christ himself on this. You can't understand God. You can't understand the mysteries of the universe. You need Jesus as light to come into the darkness. And so wherever you are in your spiritual journey, would you pray this prayer whether you believe it or not? God, would you show me the light? Would you lighten up the darkness? Would you reveal yourself to me? Would you show me that you are real? That's the only way we come to salvation is when God brings light into our dark places. And now into this dark world, right, where we see all kinds of horrible things happening and brokenness and trouble and crime and war and pain and death and grief and sorrow and depression. In all of those dark places, what do we do? We, we ask God to send light. And he sends light in these dark moments because God sends light into dark places. There will be a day where there's no more crying, where there's no more pain, where there's no more darkness, where, where Jesus and God themselves will be a new heaven and new earth, and they will be our light source. And we ask God in these moments, whatever we're going through, whatever you're struggling with, wherever you're at today, can you, you can take hope that God has your light, and he wants to shine it in the darkness, and he can do that today. So run, wait, and watch, and see God spread his light. And if you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, if you're on some spiritual journey today, I want to say to you that God wants to wipe away the darkness. God wants to free you. God wants to fulfill these promises and adopt you into the family of God. And so maybe today's the day where you accept, where you follow, where you say, God, I'm trusting in you. I believe in the foreknowledge of God. I believe that you love me and that you died for me. And I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for my darkness. I confess this. God, today I want to become a follower of Jesus. Today can be the day. Today can be the day, friend, where you become a part of the family of God. And if you know God and you understand God, don't allow the darkness to come back in. Don't allow discouragement. Don't allow despair. Don't allow the lack of hope. God gives all of those things to everyone who asks. You know, the last thing that it says in Peter is that, that God is for us. That God is for us. He says that he is forever. In 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25, the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. 
And this word is the good news that was preached to you. You see, the other reason that Jesus had to come as a baby is he had to show us that even though our lives are temporary, I'm not going to last forever. My body someday will fail, right? My house will deteriorate. My car will break down. My kids will grow old, right? We are all on this path of uh, our life is but a vapor. And that, that's how it goes, except, except for Jesus. Jesus is the one who gives forever. He gives life eternal. And we can rest in the word of the good news that was preached to you that those who believe in Jesus have life and life everlasting. You know, because of Jesus, we too can live forever. Luke 19, 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who were lost. He came to give life to those who are dead. And that's the mission that we join Jesus in. We understand as followers of God that he's come to spread the good news, to give those who are lost life and life eternal. You see, God always gives eternal life to each person who believes. That's a guarantee. As I was talking to my friends, these two guys on the same day about what it meant to follow Jesus, I said, so what are you hoping in? What are you believing in? He says, well, I'm just trying to be good enough. I think I'm going to do more good, and, and I'm going to do good, and, and Jesus is going to see that. He's going to understand that, and God is going to allow me to have forever. And I said, that's not what the Bible says. And I said, you know John 3, 16? He goes, yeah, I know John 3, for God so loved the world. And he finished it. For God so loved the world. He gave his only son that whoever what? Works for him? Whoever does more good than bad? No, no, no. It's whoever believes in Jesus. What do you do? With baby Jesus. Who do you say I am? He'll ask Peter. And Peter writes for us in 1 Peter chapter 1. That I say God Jesus is foreknown. That Jesus is for you. That Jesus is for God. And that Jesus is forever. And if you believe in him. He gives you those fours. Let's bow our head and close our eyes together. God, we know that there's one event that changed the world, and that's the birth of Jesus. When God became flesh, God, we, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for the peace that passes understanding, the joy that's unspeakable in all of our lives. And God, on this morning, as we pause to think about our walk and our relationship with you, God, would you allow us to know you more, help us to understand you more? God, for those of us that are hurting today, God, would you help us to run to you or to wait on you or to see how you're meeting our needs? And Lord, if there's any here today that aren't sure if they know you as a personal Savior, Lord, would today be the day? With every head bowed and every eye closed, I know there's a lot of weight in this room because in this world you will have trouble. And during this next song, I want to ask you to do this. If you're carrying weight, if you're carrying burden, would you just hand that to God today and say, Lord, I'm going to give you my weight and I'm going to just stand in the light of Jesus today. I'm going to let his unspeakable joy be my joy. I'm going to let his unexplainable peace be my peace. And today I'm going to run to the, to the strong tower. Today I'm going to wait on my Savior. Today I'm going to look for how he's meeting my needs. Maybe you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus. Could today be the day, in the quietness of this moment, that you turn your heart over to him? Stop trusting in anything else to save you and simply trust in Jesus. If you're ready to put your faith in Jesus in the quietness of this moment, would you talk to God and say this? Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. Will you forgive me? I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again for me. And today, I want to decide to become a follower of Jesus. Today, I want to be saved. Today, I believe. Today, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, your forever has been changed. And after this song, Chris is going to come and tell you how we can celebrate that together.
As you're doing business with God, join with the worship team in the song. Unspeakable joy. Joy to the world. Here we go. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven, heaven, nature sing. Savior reigns. Let all their songs employ while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Joy unspeakable. Here we go. Joy unspeakable joy in overflowing well. No tongue can tell. Joy unspeakable joy. It rises in my soul. Never lets me go. I hope that that was an encouragement to you. And again, I'm glad that you've joined us today. Wherever you are in your spiritual journey, we hope that this has been an encouragement to you. And if you heard something that lifted your spirits, hey, take a moment to share it with your friends online. Again, we'd love to hear from you. So go to branchlife.church and fill out that connection card. Let us know that you worshiped with us and let us know how we can pray for you. We hope you'll join us for the next episode. And until then, God bless and have a great rest of your week.